We are in the midst of the Nano Rimo Prepathon. And if you have not heard of Nano Rimo, it is the amazingly fun season for writers in which we all attempt to write 50,000 words in the month of November. <laughs> it stands for the National Novel Writing Month. So the month of November is NaNoWriMo and is a global event. Writers all over the world started out as a sort of fiction writers thing. You know, all of us who wanted to write a novel and we could never put aside the time or the self-doubt to just write. Um, it was like a big group challenge to say, well, let's write 50,000 words in November, which I mean, for those of us who like have holidays to think about and, and other things were like, November, really? That's the month we chose? But that's the month we chose, it was November. And it started with fiction and novelists and it has since expanded. So you probably, you might've run into this. I know academics have ac, ac rimo, na, ac rimo, National Academic Writing Month. There's some nonfiction versions. There's some memoir versions. I don't know all of them, but essentially everyone sort of comes together and says, let's you know, do this challenge and hold each other accountable for writing 50,000 words is sort of the stated goal. Many people uh, choose to adapt that to their particular goals. So the uh, big ambitious tagline for our time together during October as we prepare for November is get ready for perhaps the most productive writing month of your life from setting up your writing routine hacks to creative narrating to creating I always say that wrong, creating narrative arcs for one-off books and a series, which is tomorrow, plus a full roadmap of what publishing your book will look like after the writing is done. That's actually going to be next week. We're doing a kind of two-week thing. Week one is more about writing and week two is more about publishing. So we can get all your questions answered. Today, we're going over flow state triggers, mental and physical triggers you can build into your writing space and make it easier to get into the writing flow, whether you have one dedicated writing space or whether you have to write whenever and wherever you can, and you'll want to be able to click into writing mode as quickly and as easily as possible. Um, if you want to be receiving sort of the emails and the replays and the resources, just go to paperravenbooks.com slash nano. If you are receiving emails from Zoom, you're already in, so you don't need to re-register. Um, but if you want to share this with anyone, you are welcome to. Uh, so challenges for writers and authors. And you know, I find it interesting that so many of us, in fact, I didn't actually change the slide, so I'm just going to talk over it because <laughs> um, I'm realizing that I got so sucked into some of the fun things we're talking about today. I didn't, I didn't update this slide. Um, but, you know, the, the challenges for so many of us are around this feeling of procrastination. Like, I know I want to be writing, and yet when I sit down to do the writing, it is suddenly something I don't want to do. <laughs> it, it immediately becomes like I'm almost building in this habit of not writing in a strange way. Like I, I know that I think about the writing and I dream about the writing and I feel guilty about not writing. And yet in those moments when I actually do sit down and say, okay, I'm going to do the writing a lot of times I'm not doing it. And then I'm creating these sort of bad habits and I don't really know what to do to make it different, to make it feel different, to make the writing feel enjoyable because isn't it supposed to be enjoyable? <laughs> isn't that the whole point? So that's a really common experience. If you've felt anything like that, you know, in the past or currently, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just human. You're very normal. So what are some ways to optimize your writing environment to help you trigger a flow state? And when we talk about flow, we are usually talking about some, I mean, I know there are books, um, what's his, his, the Asian guy's name who's really hard to pronounce, Thich Nhat Tihan has a whole, you know, books on flow state and things like that. And it's this experience where something is challenging um, and yet not so challenging that you can't do it, but it's challenging in a way that is exciting and engaging and it, it pulls all of yourself into the thing that you're doing. For writers, we love it when we just get absorbed into the writing, the rest of the world kind of fades away. All we think about, all we care about is the writing and it becomes 
enjoyable in a way, satisfying, fulfilling. You know, we in we in those moments we enjoy the writing for the writing's sake. You know, and so we're for many of us when we've had a taste of that, we want more of it, and and yet it feels elusive. You know, it feels like this thing that like oh. Is it going to come or is it not going to come? I'm not sure. Uh, there are some ways that we can help our minds to um, to reach that state more, more easily, more quickly. Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is also is either I got it from James Clear or he did a very good job of pulling together other research. Uh, James Clear has been writing about productivity for more than a decade for sure, probably more like 12 years. Uh, he had a very long standing blog where he wrote every Tuesday and Thursday for many, many years on the blog and sent it to his newsletter. And he collected tons of research and wrote essays around sort of productivity and uh, built up this huge platform. And then he released his book. Now, he people had been demanding of him a book for many, many years. And he finally released one. This is probably three-ish years, maybe four years ago now. Um, and it's Atomic Habits. You've probably heard of it. It has just almost taken over the productivity space. 10 million copies sold. And every single, you know, I get the the publisher's weekly trade magazine that talks about the best-selling titles. Every single week, it still mentions James Clear's, James Clear's books. Um, and so it sold a lot of copies. I like, when I talked about James Clear, I like to mention that he did have a very long-standing blog and a big following and that sort of thing before he released this book. Just to put it into context for us as authors, it's not like he just came out of nowhere. You may have felt like he came out of nowhere if you're in the productivity space, but he did not come out of nowhere. You know, he really had um, quite a large platform before he even published this book. But I love this book. Um, and a lot of what I'm talking about here today is either directly from James Clear's sort of original thought, or um, I would recommend that you re read Atomic Habits because he also pulls in and cites and, and sources a lot of great, you know, other material. So it's a really good sort of introduction um, to being more productive to building uh, the subtitle is great, right? Easy and proven way to build good habits and break bad ones. So we, and, and when we start talking about writers specifically, you know, how do people write a lot of words, we have this funny obsession and we always are wondering about other writers, like how do they do it? We talked about this a little bit yesterday. You know, we always want to know like, when do other writers write? Where do they write? How do they write? You know, as if there's some sort of magic in their particular context or environment. In fact, there's a book, I actually really enjoy it. Uh, it's called Rooms of Their Own, Where Great Writers Write. And I uh, went and pulled, it's one of the few uh, physical copies that I, uh, of books I own. I mean, I have one big bookshelf in my house and it, the books have to fit there. Otherwise they get moved along, <laughs> but um, it's a great book. And it goes through all these different writers and has really cool like artwork and stuff in it. So it's got like a discussion. Sorry, I'm trying to like hold this up. Rudyard Kipling, for instance, and it's got this really cool artwork in it. And it goes through, I don't know how many authors, 50-ish. Yeah, 50 great authors. Uh, the, the back cover is great. Discover the writing rooms of 50 great authors from attics and studies to billiard rooms and bathtubs, private islands, hotel rooms, and towers. Each offers a behind the scenes glimpse into their writing methods and the routines and the habits they perfected. And what I really enjoy about this book and not just this book, but if you have a writer or someone who you really admire read their biography. It's fascinating. You know, like I got into a, a weird stint where I was reading a whole bunch of stuff about like the 1800s. So I was reading like biographies about like Dostoevsky and Abraham Lincoln. And I don't know. And it's fascinating. Like for so many of the people who we admire, Einstein, um, oh, he was 1900s. For so many of the people who we admire, we think that their lives must have been easy and simple and they must have been quite focused. And yet when you read some of these biographies of people that we admire, you quickly find out their lives were messy. 
and difficult. There was probably intense suffering, right? And so the fact that they produced anything at all is kind of mind boggling, you know, like, um, like Abraham Lincoln's biography, I'm sure, you know, we all have heard bits and pieces of his story about how poor he was and losing his family members and his wife and intense depression. And he wanted to be a senator, but lost the election and, you know, wasn't even a great lawyer. <laughs> all of these things they had to overcome, right? Dostoevsky, you know, was imprisoned in Siberia. <laughs> like there are just in incredible things. Uh, uh, Einstein uh, had, you know, very complicated personal life with his mistress and children and like, just, it was not like their lives were not necessarily conducive to productivity. Um, and this book really highlights some of that too. And, and it's funny because we, we all adapt, right? We, we have to find ways despite our circumstances to pursue the things that are truly important to us. I think is is the message I keep coming back to. And I'm, I post it noted a few of the authors I wanted to um, cite as examples here. So we've got James Baldwin. I feel like I'm doing story time with my kids. James Baldwin, this lovely artwork. And it says of James Baldwin, um, one thing that was constant throughout his career was that he wrote almost exclusively at night, starting after dinner and finishing around 4 a.m. This was a habit that was forced upon him as a teenager living in New York when he looked after his younger siblings and worked during the day, leaving him only the night for writing. He continued the routine as an adult because he said it was the only time he could be alone. Can you imagine starting writing after dinner and going till 4 a.m.? You know, not because he wanted to, but that's that's what he adapted to, right? Uh, another one that I thought was really fascinating was um, Agatha Christie. It's a great picture of Agatha Christie with all her books and some more artwork. Um, so Agatha Christie had uh, her own rhythm. She, generally, she started a new book in January and finished it around springtime, right? So she released basically a new book every single year uh, before Christmas time. And I love the idea of the seasonality of that. And I think for many of us, that seasonality could be interesting to play with. You know, um, I almost break my life into you know, we've got um, spring, summer, and fall. And I know there are more seasons than that. <laughs> like there's winter in there somewhere, but I've got like three major chunks of my year. And somehow like the, the, a few months in there get lost to birthdays and holidays, you know, sort of like November, December, early January. I just, I don't make a lot of plans. <laughs> it tends not to happen, right? Um, and I don't know, maybe your life has some of that seasonality as well. If you're in the academic world or you have kids or you have a job that requires travel in certain seasons or conferences in certain seasons, right? And so I think Agatha Christie's idea of I start a new book in January and I finish it in springtime is really amazing. Or for me, maybe if we're getting trained by NaNoWriMo, we're starting a new book in November and we're finishing by, you know, February by Valentine's Day, whatever it is, you know, whatever sort of um, rhythmic ideas we can start to introduce to our, our writing life. Okay, just a couple more that were <laughs> very fascinating. Okay, here's Victor Hugo. Let's see if I can get, do your story time here. Here's Victor Hugo, Le Miserable. This made me laugh. Okay, you ready? All right. Hugo spent his mornings writing, uh, and he said, a writer who gets up before daybreak and finishes his day at noon has done well. He told a uh, French journalist, Paul Stapfer, who visited him at Hotville, um, that he had, listen to this, two raw eggs and a cup of cold coffee for breakfast before sitting down to write two raw eggs and a cup of cold coffee. That's what we choose to do. That's what we choose to do. Uh, <laughs> this did not always go well, perhaps not the least because as Stapfer, the journalist remarked, disorder and chaos had their empire in this upper room. So that was apparently Victor Hugo had a lot of uh, disorder and chaos in addition to his two raw eggs and cold coffee. Okay, last one, last one. 
So Sylvia Plath, where's your artwork? So nice, I love that. I like Sylvia Plath because um, she also had, how many kids did she have? I don't remember how many kids she had, but she also took care of the kids, which I always find helpful. Okay, so Plath wrote a letter, letter to her mother describing the table in the dining room, which she and Hughes, um, I was going to get his, how do I not know his first name off the top of my head? Who's she married to? Ted, Ted Hughes. Sorry. Um, she and Ted Hughes wrote side by side, his side extremely messy with paper everywhere with an open bottle of blue ink on top of piles of papers, hers neat and tidy with books and notebooks lined up next to sunglasses, seashells, and a pair of scissors, right? So um, I just thought that was interesting to imagine like two authors, right? That's their career. And they sit at the dining room table <laughs> and that's, that's where they do it. So yes. And Susan Elizabeth is also talking about Stephen King on writing is another great book. So um, it's right. We're fascinated by these things and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Humans are inherently curious. We want to know how other people do it as well. I would say it's also helpful to cultivate a funny obsession with wondering how do I do it? you know, um, turn that sort of introspectively and say, well, what, what triggers work for me? And so I have some very specific recommendations that I suggest that you play with out of pure curiosity. <laughs> so, and, and I want to present to you some options that I hope will work whether you have a primary writing space, you know, you come and you sit down every day to do the writing or whether you need a more nomadic writing space. You know, maybe you need to take your writing space with you on planes and trains and automobiles to hotels, to family members' houses, to conference rooms, wherever. And maybe you need to train your mind to respond to triggers wherever <laughs> they need to be triggered um, so that your brain knows, okay, now it's time to write. All right, here are some very specific suggestions. And the senses are a great way to create these neural pathways that help to trigger this kind of flow state, this productive state. Um, and so I would recommend thinking about at least one of these that you could implement starting today. Here's some suggestions that have worked well for me or for different authors that, that we've worked with over the years. So sight. Can you have a sight cue? Can you have a candle on your desk? They even make little travel candles, you know? Can you have a candle that when you see the flame, it sort of um, inspires you? Or a lamp. I remember there was, uh, when I was writing my book, gosh, in 2015, um, I just had a third, our third baby. And so I had, I got a special like writing lamp with this special wattage so that, you know, I could turn the lamp on when we were doing our first feeding for the day and I could set her on the couch while I then went to do my writing. Well, I just put the laptop on my, on my lap, but I had the lamp, right? And so it was like my brain, the only time I turned that lamp on was we were doing the morning feeding and I was thinking about my upcoming writing session. Uh, photos, you know, do you want to pull out any photos that are meaningful for you, especially if um, you're in using inspiration from your actual like family members or life? Um, is there a photo album or a photo that you could sort of prop up kind of right next to your desk? Any artwork? We usually just hang artwork on the wall and just leave it there. But is there a piece of, you know, maybe a small piece of artwork that you could, again, sort of like flip up and say, oh, this artwork is so inspiring to me. Now it's time to write a note or a quote that maybe you could pull up, you know, and, and again, stick right on your laptop or your, your desktop screen. Not that it lives there all the time, right? Because that's what a, a trigger is something different, right? So you're triggering something new. You're, okay, putting this in, in my site and now it's time to write. Uh, curtains could be a great trigger. Uh, maybe you usually leave the curtains open and then maybe when it's time to write, you actually close them. Or maybe you usually leave the curtains closed and when it's time to write, you get up and you open the curtains, something like that, right? Another option, sound. Um, earplugs, well, 
absence of sound, right? So, but maybe that that uh, sensation of putting in earplugs, even if you don't need to technically, um, but putting in earplugs might uh, be a good way to sort of remove sound suddenly, and that's a, a way to trigger work. Um, Alex Hermosi is a, a, a recently popular <laughs> entrepreneur, and he talks about how he uses those big, like um, the same headphones that you would use at like an airport <laughs> to block out noise. When he sits down to work, he puts all these huge like noise canceling headphones and just listens to silence, right? And that's for him, it's time to work. Uh, if you don't like the idea of that, <laughs> you could also have, you know, white noise or nature sound. Uh, this trick has worked for me really well in the past. Putting one song on repeat drives you totally nuts for about nine minutes. And then after that, it's like you find this like weird groove and you come to like love it and anticipate like every, you know, bar of music that's about to come on and you just get into this weird groove. But if you've never tried one song on repeat, it is worth trying. It's really fascinating. Um, a soundtrack. We talked yesterday about how especially when we're writing um, novels that might have, you know, an action adventure side or a romantic side or whatever, that we could have a soundtrack for a movie, instrumental, um, you run an instrumental soundtrack that um, has that kind of energy with it. Yes, exactly. If the lyrics distract you, especially you might want the instrumental version. Um, I love Last of the Mohicans soundtrack. It's like the best. <laughs> and then I do have a, a personal recommendation. This is something I use. Brain.fm is an app that I have on my, um, I usually use it on my phone. It's not free, unfortunately, but it has these like, um, uh, what are they called? Well, they're like different beats that are meant just to help you focus. Um, but anyway, Brain.fm is really cool. I like to use that. Uh, another option uh, for triggering a sense that will say to your brain, you know, over time, now it's time to write. You can think about wearing specific socks, maybe you have some especially cozy socks or a scarf. Um, one that I've come to love is a lacrosse ball because it's very firm, um, but it's, uh, it's kind of, um, it bounces really nicely too. If y'all ever watch the West Wing with uh, Toby and his red ball, you can get them in red as well. If you want to be Toby from the West Wing and he would like bounce it against the wall, like that was his thinking ball. Um, you know, it's, it's great. And you don't have to bounce the ball the whole time. Sometimes I'll just put it like on the floor and I'll like rub my foot on it. I'll kind of back up and I'm thinking and I've got my foot on the lacrosse ball. And um, you don't have to use it the whole time. But again, it's the trigger that says to your mind, okay, now it's time to start writing. Um, worry stone or some sort of like crystal thingy, maybe like a smooth one, maybe like a rough one, but you could you know, easily sort of carry this around. And if it's one that you feel like is especially, um, uh, you associate with your writing, your creativity, your work in the world, you know, you could have kind of a special one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my kids give me little squishy toys. Again, these are simple. They're silly. They're, they're supposed to be, you know, um, not hard to, to implement. But I like these. They're kind of squishy. That'd be another option. Um, and then also just the feeling of putting in earbuds or earplugs could be something that when you feel those kind of come into your ears, like now it's focus time. Smell coffee or tea. Um, again, you might have a candle that has a certain scent to it, essential oil, room spray, perfume or cologne. Um, scent is really powerful for our memories. You know, I, you probably have some from your own life. You remember certain smells in the kitchen or someone who always had a certain scent on them or when you finally arrived at this destination and the scent of the breeze or the forest or the, you know, the, the wind, like you remember these scents, they're very powerful for us. So if you can do a scent that, that could be an extremely powerful sensory experience. Um, taste a specific coffee or tea. I would recommend, uh, this is easier to do with tea, I think, um, probably, but like if you can have a special type of tea that's like, this is my writing tea. When I make this tea and taste this tea, it's time to write. That can be very powerful. Um, even like a sparkling water flavor. Now they make all these flavors of sparkling water. It's crazy. Um, you know, sometimes we'll joke about, you can have a special wine or whiskey, but we'll, we'll try to keep things productive here, right? <laughs> we want to, uh, you know, uh, 
more alert. <laughs> but there's tons of sparkling water flavors. You can have a special flavor that's just for your writing sessions. Mint or gum or candy or whatever. Um, my kids know these are my mints. These are my writing mints. So, and they're actually a little bit tricky to like, just find out in the world. So my kids know, like when you see the little bitty ones, like get one for mom, because I go through these. Um, I could probably order them online, but, uh, and then raw eggs teasingly, but you have to think that for Victor Hugo, when he had raw eggs, he knew it's time to sit down and write. And so, um, again, I just wanted to give you some really practical things, pick one to start go for simple, go for specific. So not just any coffee or tea, but really pick one, you know, not just any music, but pick a specific piece of music that is going to be your writing music or not just any quote or artwork, but something specific that you have a meaning for that says, yes, this is, um, this is what I want to use to trigger my writing sessions. Um, and personally, just so you know, because I know I need a more nomadic writing space, I choose a few triggers that I carry in my backpack. So I always have the mints. Um, I usually have, I have a couple actually of different like stones. Um, I always have my earbuds and I usually listen to Brain FM are kind of my big ones. And those are, those are probably the three that are the most constant um, I have some different essential oil things that I'll carry occasionally. Um, when I'm at my home office, I like my, I think of Toby <laughs> with the, the lacrosse ball. So I have a few others, but those are the ones that always go with me. Um, so just think about that. If you know that's something that you're going to need, uh, something more nomadic. And I want to offer a bit of encouragement. I hesitated on whether I was going to share this with you, but right before we started, I was like, ah, I'll just take a picture. It's fine. I want you to know that even when I'm in my primary writing space, like this really is my primary writing space. This is my home office. It's not perfect. It's not clean. It's really not clean. I'm a clean person. I'm an organized person, but somehow when I'm in the midst, especially like this week, like doing, you know, these lives in the mornings, like, I don't know, like I, I just, it looks like this. This is what my space, I literally backed up to that corner by this this lamp over here and took a picture and that is exactly what it looks like right now <laughs> so it does not have to be perfectly clean it doesn't have to be messy either if you're a clean person it doesn't you don't have to mess it up <laughs> but i did want to just let you know that Although we all like, we have this these grand images of everything being in their right place, um, that many of us, that's you know whatever we're working with is whatever we're working with. <laughs> so the goal here, because we want to focus on the goal, right? Every time you sit down to write, and you engage this sensory element, you pop the mini Altoid, or you have the squishy thing that you are holding in your hand, or you're drinking the hibiscus tea, <laughs> whatever it is, every time you sit down to write and you engage this sensory element, you're creating the mental pathway that says, now it's time to write. So we can learn all about all the you know triggers that other people have built into their lives. However, in order to actually train ourselves, we just have to do it. We just have to cue the trigger and do the thing. And every time we cue the trigger and do the thing, we're building the neural pathway. So it won't be a magic 180 degree turnaround, but every session, every time that you have one of these writing sessions, it will take you further down the path toward being the writer you know you want to be. So no matter how many times, like if you've tried this before, if you're like Blaine and you heard this from me like four years ago, <laughs> and maybe we fell off the wagon of our coming back, it doesn't matter, you know, sorry, I'm calling you out again. <laughs> it doesn't matter what, you know, whether we lived up to what we wanted to do in the past, because today's what we got, right? Today is the day to start and reinforce those habits that we want to reinforce them. So, and I would, um, <laughs> I would, and when you get into James Clear's work, he actually starts with the identity work, which I think is, is great, right? 
who we are as people and what we do are very, we're embodied people. Those are, those are highly intertwined. So uh, there's this interesting intertwined, uh, intertwining between who I am as a writer and what I do, the writing I do, right? So how do you develop one without the other? I'm not sure, but we can do both at the same time is the good news, right? So we can use this opportunity every time we trigger that sensory element and we sit down and we do writing, some amount of writing, we can also bolster our evolving identity as a writer. You can choose to remind yourself, I am a writer because I'm writing. I'm becoming the writer I want to be. I am the type of person who enjoys writing. I am becoming, you know, if you want to soften that a little bit and say, I'm becoming the type of person who writes in the morning or the afternoon or the evening or the weekend, right? Whatever makes sense for you, but you can trigger the sense, begin the writing and remind yourself, I am a writer. I am becoming a, the writer that I want to be. I'm becoming the type of person who whatever, whatever, right? So um, all of this is 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 wound up in um, creating these uh, these ways of easily getting into the state where we can write. A couple of quotes that I find very inspiring and um, I reach for kind of again and again. James Clear has one, obviously, from Atomic Habits. He says, all big things come from small beginnings. The seed of every habit is a single tiny decision. As that decision is repeated, a habit sprouts and grows stronger. Roots entrench themselves and branches grow. The task of breaking a bad habit is like uprooting a powerful oak within us. And the task of building a good habit is like cultivating a delicate flower one day at a time. So um, I like that idea that every single time we repeat the decision with a trigger and a writing session, those roots go stronger and stronger and stronger. Another one from John Wooden, basketball coach, Hall of Fame. When you improve a little each day, eventually big things occur. When you improve conditioning, basketball, right? A little each day, eventually you have a big improvement in conditioning. Not tomorrow, not the next day, but eventually a big gain is made. Don't look for the big, quick improvement. Seek the small improvement one day at a time. That's the only way it happens. And when it happens, it lasts. So I love NaNoWriMo, this whole concept of let's write 50,000 words in a month. It's a fun challenge. And I think the real gift of a, an event like this is that we can begin these small improvements. We, can, we have a reason to say, you know what? I do want to change my writing environment in some way. I do want to build some new habits. And this is this is a great reason to start this work. And, you know, so long as we come at it with, I'm becoming the writer I want to be, and I am making progress toward my big goals, and I'm okay with day by day, little by little, making the changes that last, I think that's a great reason, you know? Successful author mindset killer. So this is what we'll, this is the sabotage that we tend to um, accidentally think, you know, I have to have the perfect writing routine, the perfect writing space before I begin writing as if, you know, no, understanding what such and such author did in order to do their writing um, will make a difference. You know, I have to create all of these things have to be in alignment so before I can begin writing. How I would suggest we reframe this is to say, I can optimize a few things. And every single time I start writing, I'm creating pathways toward that flow state. Every single time I pick up this weird squishy hedgehog thing that my daughter gave me <laughs> and, you know, I'm sensing it and I'm saying, this means writing time. And I pick it up, I sense it, I put it on my desk, I pat it and I start writing. 
I'm creating pathways toward the writing because there are going to be, not every session, but there are going to be sessions in which I have picked up the squishy toy, I've sensed it, I have started writing and I hit that flow state. And maybe I don't know exactly when that's gonna happen, but when it does happen, this is part of the pathway. So we just over and over and over and over again, we bolster, we build, we groove those neural pathways. The only way to create triggers for flow state is to start. And today is a good day to start. Why not? Today's the day we got. Triggers that work best long-term are both simple and specific. So not just any cup of coffee because you might drink coffee throughout the morning, right? But can you add a, a different mug, for instance, or a different creamer, if you use creamer or something, make it special in some way so that it triggers your mind. And now we are writing. Challenge for today, choose a sensory aspect that is simple to implement and try an easy writing session. Let me show you guys where the resources are, same as before. Uh, let me get the pretty link, paperravenbooks.com slash nano dash resources. I see the chat. Well, I'll come back to the chat in just a second. <laughs> Susan Elizabeth, I have to drink Primo coffee. I'm with you. I'm a little bit of a coffee snob. Okay. So paperravenbooks.com slash nano resources will take you to, um, I think it will actually take you to this page where you'll see we've got, um, here was the plan overall. Here's day one replay and resources. Day, this was about your book idea decision matrix. Day two was about your writing momentum tracker, finding your, what works best for your writing sessions. And then a special one for NaNoWriMo hitting the 50,000 words in a month. And then day three is um, about the writing triggers. And I included here, this is actually something that we created back in 2020 when the pandemic sort of shut everyone down and we were helping people to create new writing routines that were sort of at home based. I created this whole system, the personal writing protocol. So this is more information than we have covered here today. I used to spend, I think we had a seven day sort of reboot. And so we would spend, that's, what, that's why I'm teasing Blaine so much because Blaine was a part of this. <laughs> um, but several of you came into, into my world around that time. And you might remember we spent seven days sort of recreating our writing environments and, and things like that because we all were like, oh shoot, I got to work from home now. How do I, how do I write this way? And so there's information here about who are you as a writer. So some of that we were just talking about and right here at the very top, I mentioned James Clear Atomic Habits. Uh, we talk a little bit about what your writing setup is. So if you want to be thinking about, you know, am I storing my documents in Google Drive or the cloud or something else? You know, there's a little bit around um, your writing setup itself. Uh, Dropbox and things. Uh, where is your writing set up? This is where we get into the five senses um, that you're sort of creating your where with your five senses. And, and really that's what triggers things, right? Is, is the sensory, um, you know, uh, you, I think of the Pavlovian dog, right? You ring the bell and deliver the food and they start salivating. And that's the neural pathway that you're creating with a, with a sensory uh, trigger. So we're creating ourselves as Pavlovian dogs. This is what we're doing. Uh, if we keep going, we talk about when. So we actually talked a little bit about when yesterday, but if you want to go deeper into like Dan Pink, um, his book, uh, When the Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing is a really cool book. Um, so that goes a little bit deeper into when, but what we covered yesterday gets at the heart of it, you know, that of finding our own most productive times. Uh, optimizing writing routines, uh, using a tracker. So this is the exact same thing. I put this into the PDF. You're welcome to uh, create you know, your own version using this page, uh, but it's exactly the same, right? It's the date, it's the day, it's the time, it's the minutes, it's the words, um, and the working on notes. This link takes you to the same tracker, tracker that I already shared with you guys. So that's all the same. And then I have 
Um, it's just a very high level of writing a, a first draft, revising a manuscript, um, some pieces for publishing the book. We're actually going to go into a much uh, bigger thing next week. So next week, we're going to be getting into our visual roadmap. And we have this, I don't even think I have all the pages on my desk. And these are upside down. We have this huge checklist of all the things that you do when you're writing and publishing a book. We're going to go over that next week so this is like a baby version we're going to go into the the big kid version next week um and then uh, a little bit about writer's block i introduced free writing which we've already been through today and then i recommend you sort of think about all of your sort of best days and times for writing so um again this is this is a little bit of a bigger resource than uh, than what we covered today but i hope that's helpful for you um Cool. Case is like, I'm printing it out. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So yes, I see the chat. All 19 pages. That's right. <laughs> Let me go back up here just a bit and grab some of what you guys have been chatting about. Um, Isaiah says, I've wanted to write in a hotel room like once a month, like Maya Angelou and Stephen King just seems like it made great things. So expensive though. Um, one of our authors, I think it was Lori Scott, she the, like especially once she was getting towards the end of the book and she really needed time to focus she i think allocated two weekends uh she just used like the cheapest local hotel kind of in the austin area and um yeah she told everyone that she was going out of town that she wasn't going to have her phone don't call her don't talk to her you know inbox reply set for two different weekends and all she took was her laptop to write and she didn't connect to the internet and she just wrote you know so maybe we can't do it every month but maybe when we need a really big push you know that i've seen people do that oh cool people are reading this already okay um can discipline create a habit and thus a trigger? Um, yeah, that's a good question about the, the interrelationship between discipline and habit and trigger. I don't really know the whys behind all of like the, the vocabulary essentially, like what concepts mean exactly what and how do they relate? I feel like James Clear would have a lot to say on this. I tend to be a little bit more pragmatic and just say, look, I know that when I eat these little Altoids and I write, that it makes it easier the next time to eat an Altoid and write. <laughs> That's kind of all I need to know. <laughs> you know, we really boil it down to like, what is practically going to help me get a thousand words in the next hour? You know, like that, that kind of thing helps. So I would, I would, uh, although I, I have my own background in academia and there would be lots of people in my world who would geek out on that conversation. I just tend to be a little bit more pragmatic about it and just say, look, I eat an Altoid and I write, and then the next time I eat an Altoid, I have a weird desire to write. So that's great. That's what I want. <laughs> yep. Marianne, Stephen King on writing. Very cool. Sharon's like, I'll take the hot coffee and toast. <laughs> Calvin says, Balzac didn't even bother with the brewing. He just ate the coffee beans. <laughs> that could work. I worked at... Um, I worked at Starbucks uh, in my early 20s and when I was in grad school and, and doing all the things. And we had those espresso beans, the chocolate covered espresso beans. Those were my study trigger. When I was going to like, you know, study till two or three or 4 a.m., I was like, I'm coming home from Starbucks with my espresso beans. <laughs> really good. Maybe it's just the chocolate that was good. <laughs> yeah. Isaiah says, um, James Clear in his book mentions how Victor Hugo once had someone close to him hide his clothes. So he had to write in rags until he finished Les Mis. That's some accountability right there. Hilarious. Yep. Providence says, my computer is my writing space, Starbucks, the beach, New York apartment. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> Susan Elizabeth, my computer desk and coffee is a must. Positive trigger. What a concept. That's true, Providence. I had I, I sometimes forget that in sort of vernacular, we have started saying, oh, I'm triggered, meaning I'm triggered in a bad way. But trigger just means that it um, makes a particular outcome more likely, right? So it, it, it causes a, has a causality associated with this trigger tends to cause this reaction, right? So um, positive trigger, exactly. 
Yep. Susan Elizabeth, my, a picture of my miracle daughter graduating from college. It's my positive trigger. I love that. So you can, I'm sure you want to look at the picture all the time, but you could have a special picture of her. Um, that's kind of your writing picture and you pick it up and you look at the, at the photo and, and maybe like we talked about with in day one reconnects you to your why, you know, this is so important. Why this book, why now? Um, and if it, ha if it has that kind of emotional draw for you, that's amazing. You can have the actual photo, you can have a digital version, you know, that you carry with you and it can be, okay, I look at this visual stimulus and that pulls at my why for this book. And I start writing. The trick is that you do want to have something specific. When I look at this, I start writing, you know, there has to, you know, without a lot of time in between the trigger and the, and the habits that you're creating. Okay, cool. Hope that's helpful. Yeah. Sharon dropped a link to a helpful YouTube video. Yep. John, I have a comfortable chair near my fireplace. Listen to my favorite 60s songs. Perfect. Susan Elizabeth cross in a Bible. Yep. You might even, I mean, in order to get that specificity to it, um, you might even flip to a particular verse that maybe is kind of your mantra for the writing. Maybe you open the Bible, read that particular verse and write. Yep. Perfume from the nineties for a memoir. That's a great idea. I love that. Okay, cool. I think I've caught most people's comments. Anise. Yep. Lavender oil, Neroli perfume. Very cool. I'm a Marish Givenchy. I guess that's a cologne. <laughs> yep. Tiger eye touchstone. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Sounds like we are answering most of the questions. Feels like we're pretty clear. Okay. Reminders on my phone. That, I mean, that's an interesting idea, Isaiah, to have a reminder pop up on your phone. Um, if you've decided on a particular time and you tend to get lost and forget what time it is. Yep. Okay. You are welcome. You are welcome. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Andrea, I'm not sure there is a chat happening right now. So if you, I don't know why you wouldn't be able to see it. Oh, antique doll. That's very cool too. Okay. I hope I got everybody's questions answered in all of that. And for tomorrow, we are talking through sketching a narrative arc. The best way to balance plotting your book so you have a clear idea of what you're writing and pantsing your book so you can enjoy the surprise and delight of letting the story unfold and stay focused on getting to the end of your book. And so tomorrow we're gonna go through um, the idea of a narrative arc. We're gonna focus on a fiction novel. There are definite corollaries to memoir and nonfiction writing as well. We are going to focus on the fiction novel, mostly because many of us are prepping for National Novel Writing Month. And so um, we're going to focus on a one-off kind of story arc. And then Christine Roberts, who is our author marketing specialist and one of our authors, she's written seven books in two years. And they're amazing. She writes um, in sort of an action adventure romance kind of genre. And she has this fantastic system that she uses herself, but also has coached other writers in um, creating these series arcs. So how do you take the arc for one story and kind of layer them? And there's three different approaches to a series that we want to present to you. And um, oh, DL, it is right here. So if you click that link, um, it will take you to it will take you to this area with the resources. Yep. And so it's right there. Um, so we're going to, there are three different ways that you can approach a series. Either way you approach a series, you're going to want to stack your narrative arcs in a certain way. So you can either stack them um, for more like um, individual episodic uh, adventures or, uh, or books, you can stack them, you know, more like a series where the protagonist goes through a major transformation, sort of a huge story arc, and each individual book has its own arc. Um, and then there are, there's another way that we talk about, oh, more like creating a universe 
where there are different protagonists having sort of different adventures, but they they interlink in some way. So we're gonna be going sort of much deeper into story arcs, narrative arcs tomorrow. And I did want to give you guys a heads up that we have a book coaching and mentorship program, and um, I'll be talking more about that uh, on Friday, and we're going to be opening up a cohort for uh for this fall, basically, where we're going to take folks through the writing process this fall and early into next year, and then um, actually helping you to publish and launch the books in 2024. So I just wanted to give you guys kind of first heads up. I will send out the information for that. Um, in fact, I probably have it. I'll put it in the email when I'm sending out the replay for you, but let me just go ahead and grab the link. Kind of a long link. But in case you want to see the details on that program, I'll be talking about it on, on Friday um, more specifically, but we do this 12 month kind of coaching and mentorship where we're working with you on actually writing your manuscript. And then you're working directly with our team on cover design, interior design, formatting all of your files, publishing everything. So we're really doing that work with you as well as teaching you how to do it yourself. Um, and then we also help with some of those marketing pieces, websites, freebies for your email list, um, your social media plan, um, actually launching the book, that sort of thing. So if you want some more information about that, feel free to check it out now. I wanted to go ahead and give you an early heads up because I am going to send out kind of emails to everyone either Friday or maybe Monday, something like that. And if you guys wanted to just chat with our team about, you know, what it would be like to work with us in that, in that kind of program, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up first. So that will be coming down the pipeline. I think we're going to start talking to folks um, maybe on Monday. So if you wanted to go ahead and slide yourself in for a Monday conversation, that would be, that would be something worth thinking about. Alrighty, we are going to go ahead and call it complete for today. Find your sensory thing, get your tea, get your photo, get your squishy toy, get your, you know, mint, whatever it's going to be. Let us know how it goes. Can't wait to see how the writing session goes. Get your raw eggs ready. <laughs> and uh, tomorrow we're going to dive deep into narrative arts. It would be great. Yes, that's the assignment, Andrea. Get your trigger. And just experiment, just play, just be curious, right? We're not judging here. We're just um, seeing if there's an, a helpful trigger that we can kind of put into our writing routines. And um, yeah, all it's as simple as enter the stimulus, do the writing, and you are on your way to beginning to create that neural pathway to do the writing, as well as, you know, bolstering that evolving, emerging identity of being a writer. You know, I am a writer who sits down and writes in the morning or every day, or, you know, when I have my stimulus, this is what I do. I am a writer. The replay will be posted for you guys. I'll send it out shortly and I hope you'll have a great rest of your morning. Alrighty. Bye everybody.